Today is going to be an amazing day. If we have not had the privilege of meeting just yet, my name is Daniel Groves, and alongside my beautiful wife, Jackie, our incredible team, we have the privilege and honor of serving and leading this incredible church, and man, we are building on a foundation of seven incredible years of God's faithfulness. We are moving into a new season where people are getting set free, even at a greater rate. Let me, let me, let me give you some fruit so you can shout. Uh, since January 1 of this year to today, we've seen 836 commitments to Jesus. That, that's amazing. Those are the numbers we care about. So if this is your first time, thanks for hanging out. Today's gonna be a special day. My wife, Jackie, preached with heat last week. If you missed it, you can go back and uh, check it out of our YouTube channel, our Hope City YouTube page. Uh, you can check it out. She is literally a Deborah in the house. Judges 4 talk about this woman named Deborah, who was a prophet, who was ready for battle. Generals respected her. And I'm telling you, Jackie, you walked up here with the orange hair glow and the heat, and you brought the word, and it was amazing. You can go back and check that out. We are in week number two, though, of Beyond the Blessing. And I want you to position yourself today to take down notes. Uh, I have a mentor, a father in the faith, a friend who has poured into Jackie and I for the past almost 18 years. Before we had kids, when we were just Dan and Jackie, just trying to figure out life, this amazing couple, Dr. Scott Hagen and his amazing wife, Pastor Karen, they begin to take us in and pour into us. I'm the dad I am today and husband I am today because of mentorship, accountability, and a man who took a chance on a kid that lined his hair out, lined diamond earrings, thought I was John B., only sang R&B music, let's go. They call me White McKnight, okay. <laughs> Do I ever cross your mind? Okay, that's enough. We're saved, this is church, we're in church. Uh, so Dr. Hagen texted me and said, hey, I'm gonna be on the front row shouting you down today. And I said, sir, you're in the, you're, if you're in the house, you need to join me on stage. Can you welcome to the stage Dr. Scott Hagen as we talk about favor, leadership, week two of Beyond the Blessing family hugs. Plus, look at the dynamic. I'm wearing Nikes and a sweatshirt, and you look like a president of a university, which you are. Very So kind. honored to have you here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, January 30th, uh, our installation weekend, Pastor Tim Ross brought an incredible word on Ezekiel and the dry bones. You can go back and check it out on our YouTube page. And then you and Pastor Karen uh, prayed over us along with the overseers trustees, and uh, man, we've only seen God's hand moving. It's incredible what God has been doing and what he's faithful. That's the key. He's faithful to complete uh, because we already had such an incredible foundation, and so we're building from here. So today, we're going to have a conversation. Uh, last service was incredible. I believe this one's even going to be better. So again, welcome Dr. Hagen. Uh, good to see everybody. I, I'll never compete with your shoe game, but I did bring my boots with zippers on them. That's like my little Dan Grove zipper boots, right? Those are fancy. I just want to say, too, that I have the joy of pretty much being in a different church. I was at um, Trinity Church in Dallas last Sunday and uh, get a chance to travel the country. I mean, a lot of churches that have multi-service uh, formats like this, two, three, sometimes four services, and I just want to tell you that the research has been done and it's been proven that if you go to a church with three services, uh, the most spiritual people in the church go to the second service. <laughs> they do. True story. Those, those nine o'clock folks. unfounded research. Yeah, no, but the, the nine o'clock crowd, we, they were here checking it off the list. They're already at lunch. We know that. Uh, the next service, they're still in bed. Right, they but are. You, you folks... And put Jesus at the center yep. of your life because you go to the middle service. The most spiritual people in America go to the middle service. Middle service. I told the first service that too. Dan. Yeah, you did. You I, said the I exact same I, thing I in the last service. That. So, anyway, honestly, just a tremendous honor to be back at Hope City. I, I follow every weekend. Uh, one because we love uh, your pastors a great deal. So no, not, no matter where we are, we always have a, our eye a glance toward Houston. And just seeing the great grace, the energy, uh, the great grace that has building on this great seven years of foundation. It was so great to sit next to the Fosters up here. Dad and Mom, we yeah. welcome you. We bless Bishop you. Bishop Mark, Miss Paula. I didn't know who you were, and you stood next to me. And first of all, it was good to see somebody else from the 1900s uh, that was here. But you worshiped within one second there was a fire on your life next to us. And I, I walked over and I said, Pastor, who, who's this? 
And then he told me, and I said, oh, that, exactly. I actually remembered now, but I just want to honor you, and it's just a great blessing that you are here. Love you. So, president of North Central University, yeah. Minneapolis, incredible university. In your library, one of the most amazing things for me, being able to tour the library there, is a handwritten letter from Smith Wigglesworth recommending some apprentices to go to North Central. It's just rich in history, multicultural. You're a phenomenal leader. You and Pastor Karen had planted a church in Elk Grove called Harvest Church that is absolutely, I mean, it's, it's heaven touching earth in that area. Uh, we met you in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, Jackie and I had a season, seven years in Michigan. I'm a Buckeye, so there's a lot of conflicts with my family. Um, a lot of loved ones wrote me off. Um, <laughs> because of the Wolverines. Uh, but we met you, and you guys, it was like a collision. I mean, you guys took us in and mentored and poured into us. Your son Tyler traveled with us when we were traveling and doing music tours. And then you guys went back to Sacramento, planted a church, and then God called you guys to go to Minneapolis. One of the most amazing things about your life that I have picked up on is the tremendous value that you bring to everybody you meet. Uh, you're really intentional about uh, getting people's names, remembering their names. You're really intentional about looking people in the eye. You're really intentional about pouring into someone because you know it's not just pouring into them, but pouring through them as a domino effect to someone else that they can reach. So thank you for all the years you poured into us. But I want to talk about adding value. What does it look like to add value? And also, we've got Pastor Karen on the front row, yeah. so I want to honor her as well. Yeah, she, she speaks all over this country. She just actually was speaking yesterday in Minneapolis. I came from California, and we met last night uh, at the airport, and both, our luggage both arrived at Carousel 5. So, Carousel 5. So it's still working for us. 40 years of marriage. Let's go, 40 in August. Years. It's great. We both are turning 60 and uh, halfway to 120 and uh, 40 years of marriage. But this is my favorite. I got to show you my favorite picture of my bride. Uh, if you could put that up here real quick. This is circa 1960, uh, probably 65. You're probably three or four years old. Uh, over on the side screens, you see the full shot, the matching purse, the, the green dress, the little bent feminine wrist, the, the little uh, hair barrette thing, the page boy haircut. But it's the gleam in her eye. <laughs> It's that smile and that gleam. Very few things on this planet can put that gleam in a woman's eye. I think God has shown Karen her future. I think that gleam is because, here, I think this is what she's seeing from the Lord, I think. It's like a Sears Husky catalog. Oh, wait. <laughs> Look at little buddy. Oh, wait a minute here. We're just getting to know each other. That was a little strong, folks. That was a little strong. But Are those my, velvet shorts? Yeah, little twisty velvets uh, shorts there. That's Easter Sunday, 1966, Fresno, California. Wow. Little patent leather shoes there. My brother next to me is in his prison outfit there with his <laughs> shorts. And But my dad worked in the lumber industry, and his pride and joy was his chainsaw. I remember the smell of this chainsaw. He'd go up in the mountains and cut trees. And my dad, all, he, uh, he loved his chainsaw. But he also was responsible for our haircuts. And I think he combined the chainsaw yeah. with that haircut. You looked happy about it. Yeah, but I, I do tell all my students at the university that you put a pair of skinny jeans on that. That is a modern worship leader's haircut right that there. Is. That would be on any stage in America. It that is. guy's haircut right it's there. Valid. So those two little kids collided. And now life 40 years later, we've had, we have four wonderful kids. And, uh, but we also have this. So we have, there's 10 of them. They overwhelm you. And number 11 is on the way. So that's our, that's our, our grandchildren. And I love the diversity. So you're a diverse leader. Uh, you literally poured into us before we had kids about when we have kids to teach our kids not to be colorblind to see color because Genesis 127, to see people created in the image of God. You guys sowed seeds then that went beyond the blessing because now we're teaching those same principles to our kids about the beauty of diversity, the, the representation of culture. And we're a church that looks like heaven. I mean, you cannot find a majority across any of our campuses. Heaven is literally touching earth. And it's amazing living in the overflow of some of the seeds that you planted in us. T talk about your four kids real quick, because I, 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 it's amazing. Yeah, super fast. So, you know, you just live your life. People ask me all the time, how did this become this? And uh, they're really, in this arena, it's not a deep strategy. It's just learning to love without limitation uh, and not having uh, social conditioning uh, but the kingdom of God uh, guide my mind and our heart. So our kids, you know, grew up in a very, uh, you know, diverse church. It looked like heaven was the phrase we used. 
And so it's interesting, our family, my oldest daughter, Jocelyn, she married a wonderful man from Brazil who showed up in my church at age 25 named Marcelo. Oh, wow, he sounds And so when Marcelo showed up, I said, this is going to be a problem. And they're about the same age as my 25-year-old single daughter, and your, your, na your name is Marcelo. That's a problem in and of itself. Yeah. Suave, Brazilian. Yeah. Um, uh, 20 years earlier, I was in Brazil. I went to this kid's house when he was five. I patted him on the head. I vividly remember patting his head when he was five. 20 years later, he shows up in my life in America. And my daughter falls in love with him. He marries her now. And so I tell young dads all the time on Sundays, be very careful who you pat on the head. Yes. Don't be patting children on the head because, oh, I, it, prophesying. You're picking them. And they have kids. Two beautiful. kids, Olivia and uh, Tessa. And then my son, Tyler, he married a beautiful Latina. Uh, her name is Nicole Medina. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And uh, she is something else. Two and kids. Two kids, uh, Gemma and Elias. Elias, he's awesome. He calls her Gaga, which is super cute. That's cute, that's cute. Till he turned to me and called me Kaka. Okay, all right. And I said, wait, 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 I took Spanish in junior high. Yeah. Oh, we ain't calling Grandpa Kaka here. That no, ain't no, no. gonna fly. So no. we, we immediately paid for speech therapist as fast <laughs> as possible. Then uh, we have another son, Spencer, yep. went to Cal, played football, and was uh, headed to the NFL, played uh, in the Pac-12 and play with Keenan Allen, Marvin Jones, all you football fans out there. And uh, he caught a pass for playing at Ohio State, the dreaded know, horseshoe, sorry about fourth this. quarter, going for the winning score, catches the ball on the 16. Gets hit. He's a tight end, got hit by Christian Bryant, broke his knee, 90 degrees back, put his calf on the ground backwards. So much information. Uh, yeah, too much. Full dislocation, almost <laughs> got his leg amputated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they saved his leg and repaired it. But it I remember you called me from the hospital. Yeah, crying my eyes. A specialist was in there. We prayed together. It was tough. That specialist knew what to do, not only saved his leg, but he's coaching. I mean, today he's, yeah, he's, he's leader of leaders. Leader of leaders. He married a beautiful black girl that is the joy of our life, Brianna. And uh, they have two beautiful children, Emerson and Spencer Jr. And then, so I got a Brazilian son-in-law, a Latina daughter-in-law, a black daughter-in-law. And then my other son, Kramer, just married a white girl. Okay. So, All right. uh, uh, and she's special too. She's very special. She's amazing. So, but we have this family that she's special looks too. like heaven. So God has blessed us. All right, let's talk about adding value. So the key, if we're talking about that transaction, transaction of the kingdom that Jesus mas masterfully done, did for us and showed us all these models, it all begins with this, Pastor. It's that people have to feel warmth from you instantly. Mm. Especially if you have a title of any kind. I don't care whether you're the usher on the back aisle over here. If you have a title, you have power. You're a gatekeeper. People are always nervous around gatekeepers. So the transaction and the goal of kingdom leadership, I'm not talking about organizational leadership. I'm talking about the intentional and intense salt and light impact influence upon everyday believers. Everyday believers. Everyday always. believers. Is the transaction is you have to communicate warmth because here's what happens. When you're warm to people, it tells them the relationship has a future. Even if it's for five seconds. So if somebody meets you and it's cold and it's calculated and swift and it's just a transaction. On your phone. And yeah, you're just dismissive. It tells them that the relationship has no future. And that person, the effect on the person is they constrict and they even will start to boast and they become defensive and they become somebody that they're really not creating. You're not bringing out the best in that person. So that transaction of warmth is really where the value add to human beings takes place. And so Karen and I, you know, we were newly married. We were in the ministry of pastors and we'd have Sunday night visitor receptions at our house. And we, sometimes we forgot that people were coming over and it's, and I'm walking by the front door and I see someone walking up the sidewalk, go, oh my gosh, we have people coming over. So we're flying through the house in 30 seconds, throwing stuff in the, in the closet, under the bed, running air freshener through the house as fast as possible. That when we open the door, people think, oh, you just lived this way. Yes. Um, how wonderful. And I would be so nice to the man and she'd be so nice to the woman. And we're just all kind, kind. Get in the kitchen and kind of like, blah, 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 blah. go back out, be super sweet. Then to each other, blah, 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 blah. and then super sweet. We got in bed that night. We laughed, uh, we laughed at each other. And we said, you know what? Uh, we have got to treat, do good to all people, but especially the household of faith. 
So we're going to continue to treat other people well, but we're going to treat each other as well as we treat any other person That's well good. in this house. And we just made this commitment, Dan, that we would have that exchange of warmth between us. And at that point, then it says our relationship has a future. Then you build from that point. Yeah, that's good. And I think something that I've seen you do as well, so well, um, is when, when you meet someone, when you speak into their life, you, you taught me something years, years ago. Well, well two, two, two incredible things that I still carry today. One day you were on the phone with Banning from Jesus Culture and a couple other guys that you mentored, including me, and you said, hey, smell your shirt. And I remember smelling my shirt, and you were like, smell it really good. I was like, you're like, what's this smell like? I was like, Tim McGraw cologne? I don't know. J- Michael Jordan? <laughs> Jupe? I don't know. Like, and you said, no, no, if your shirt smells more like the green room than sheep, you'll miss out on the greatest years of your ministry. Make sure you're connecting with people, looking at them in the eye, because it could trigger something in someone. If you dismiss someone, they could feel not necessary. They could feel undervalued. They could feel underappreciated. They could feel like no one sees me. And so you spoke that. The other thing that you spoke so uh, eloquently in our lives years ago was when you encounter someone, and there are people that walk into Hope City at all of our locations, literally internationally in the States, and people that watch online, there's two approaches. You're either in an incubator season or you're in an accelerator season. You can come in and need healing. You can come in and get some rest, but there's also people that come in, they're ready to put their foot on the pedal and thrive and step into their next season of ministry, of serving. But you always talk, like filter it when you're talking to somebody. Are they in the incubator season or the accelerator season? That same university, Ohio State, my brother's born without a hip socket. They tell my parents, uh, he's not gonna walk right. He's not gonna play sports. He's always gonna have a, a, a weird issue with his gait when he walks. There was a specialist there. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could actually time it and it was the same guy that did surgery on Spencer? I should research it. Uh, I have no facts on that, but what if it was? Um, But he said, I have an idea. They created this makeshift cast and put my brother in an incubator, this healing environment, this warmth. And over a period of weeks and early months, they took the cast off and his body had formed. Now, they said it was a medical mystery. I believe it was a miracle. You know, my brother never had issues with walking. He played sports. He was completely healed, but they talked about the incubator versus they had to get him out of the incubator. You can't stay in the incubator season forever. There is a healing that takes place, and then you accelerate. You've taught, uh, you've taught me that for years, to see people through those two filters. Are they in an incubator season or an accelerator season? And that's one way to bring value. The way that I have framed it, Dan, is that, is, sorry for calling you Dan. So we're family. He calls me Dan. Uh, but um, people come into Hope City with basically two questions, only two questions. Everybody carries these two questions, but one of the questions is a larger circle and the other question is a smaller circle. And I would pretty much say it's split down the middle of this room. Half the people walk in this church and say, do you love me? And the other half walk in and say, do you need me? It's, those are the two questions we have to answer as local churches. Let, let's backtrack for a second about that issue of the transaction of warmth. Some people say, well, that's just kind of a soft little, nice little. No, this is, this is radical warfare to win the hearts of people, friends. When Jacob and Esau encountered each other, they were broken brothers, born in the same womb, but they built separate empires. The Bible says that Jacob was afraid of his brother Esau. Imagine that. You're twins, born in the same woman, but you're afraid. And it says that Jacob saw Esau ahead of him with 400 men, and he was afraid. And so he put a bunch of gifts in front of him. He put his concubines first, and the things that were most fraudulent about him, he put first, the gifts, the things that were the most honest, he kept in the back. So that he presented his most kind of manipulative self first to that person because he wanted to get through him, not, not to him. And there's a huge difference. So he, he's afraid of his brother. But then they reconcile and they weep in each other's arms and God does this miracle. And he says to his brother, when I saw your smile, it was like seeing the face of God. Wow. It's one of the greatest lines in all the Bible. When I saw your smile, it was like seeing the face of God. So when we talk about this transaction of warmth, don't think it's some little soft skill set of the kingdom. This is at the forefront of piercing the lies and unmasking the lies of the enemy is being able to see that heart opened up uh, before you. So it's, it's the way Jesus dealt with people. He didn't approach people with suspicion. 
with openness. So here, here's the way we frame that question. Do you love me? Do you need me? So half the people coming in here have come out of a traumatic situation. They've wandered in here and the worship and the atmosphere and your smile is what they need. Do you love me? I'm not ready to engage yet in the doing. I just need some healing in my life. So good. You have to have a mechanism and a culture and really I, I would call it an atmosphere before a culture. Atmosphere is what happens in your culture is what happens in Houston, okay? So atmosphere is what's going on in every conversation with every person I make eye contact. That's atmosphere. We got young leaders who want to change culture, but they're horrible at atmosphere. They don't know how the tone and timing of words and how to draw out unscripted passion in people because they just want to display their own passion. And said, it's not about your passion. It's about getting the unscripted passion of other people unscripted to emerge. So you've got to, you've got to control yourself and, and develop atmosphere with that individual. So people come in, they're hurting. Do you love me? Does God love me? I don't even know what that word means anymore. So you have to have a culture and a mechanism for love, for people to be healed. The other half of the people are saying, hey, do you need me? I'm, I'm strong. I, I've got, I got it going with the Lord, everything's strong. Man, does that church need me? You have to have a mechanism to engage people that are ready to be used. Now, ultimately, both things have to happen in people's lives. Quick, quick little Bible verse on this that I think is powerful. Two great attacks in the early church, Dan, Acts 6, there was a care issue in the church. The widows, uh, the uh, Hellenistic widows, Greek-speaking widows, were being overlooked in favor of the Jewish widows. So there was this categorization of race going on in the care structure of the church, and it almost imploded the early church in Acts chapter 6, so that's where deacons emerged. The Lord birthed a brand new structure to offset this attack of care. Acts 15, man, it wasn't about care. It was about truth, about grace and works, and it was splitting the church. You could come to this church. It could be the greatest truth-telling church. You could be doctrinally spot on. Everything is dialed in. You come up and say, hey, my grandma's in the hospital. Uh, can some, I'm new here. Can someone see her next week? Hey, my grandma's in the hospital. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Third week, hey, my grandma's in the hospital. You could be preaching the gospel spot on. If no one goes to see grandma and pray, pray with her, it doesn't matter how much truth you're telling. You have to care for people. Yes. But you could be the most caring church in all of Houston. Your systems are perfect. But you get up and say one Sunday, I'm not quite sure that Jesus is the son of God. I'm out of here. Wow. Because you have to be caring and truth telling. You have to be loving and you also have to tell people they're needed here in leadership and in service. So that's what I think the balanced church moving forward looks like. So our church is uh, very groups fueled. I mean, how many of y'all are in a group? Come on, wait. Awesome. There's groups, literally online groups. We have people all over. We have freedom groups. We were talking, Jack and I were talking to somebody in the lobby earlier, and she was sharing with us about her little son who's about to turn two, and he was born with a heart defect, and all the scans that have been coming back are no heart murmurs. He's completely healed. And she said, let me tell you, it's the sermons, it's the worship. And she said, every doctor appointment, I shoot out a text blast to my group. And I've got a group of people that are praying and calling heaven down. We have a church that cares. We have a church that has grace and truth. We have a church that says, oh, oh you have someone who needs prayed for. We all believe the healing is in our hands. We all believe the same Holy Spirit that speaks from this microphone through a leader is the same Holy Spirit that speaks to and through us. Another thing that we're trying to establish and continue to establish in the atmosphere and the culture here is that there you are, not here am I sort of leadership model. So we walk into a room and we say, God, John chapter three, verse 30, I need you to increase as I decrease. So any unhealthy ambition, any pride, any need to be seen, anything that I need, a healthy pat on the back of affirmation, God, I don't need to be seen. Let me be a representative of you. You say something about great leaders seeing people in a room. Can you talk yeah. about that for a minute? I, I try to train our young leaders in this very simple. And this is for maximum. everybody. It is for everybody is that great leaders see everybody in the room. Poor leaders only notice those who notice them. So if you're noticing That's me, I notice you. Um, but, if, but great leaders, kingdom, Jesus leaders. Another way to frame that, that beautiful way you just described, the hope for Hope City, um, being that truth-telling, caring, loving church, 
when the Good Samaritan found the one wounded along the roadside, um, he poured wine and oil into the wound. Okay. Um, that's critical to understand what's going on there because if you put wine into a wound, everybody knows it's going to sting. That alcohol will. Why, why would you put pain into pain? Because you have to cleanse the wound before you close the wound. Wow. So when people come into Hope City wounded, that doesn't mean that we're afraid to be truth-telling because the, the truth of God's word sometimes stings as it kills the bacteria. Because if you close the wound without cleansing the wound, the bacteria will do what the blade could not. So, but, so you can't just be, though, a wine-only church. A lot of churches in America, we just tell people the truth. And it's ouch, 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 ouch. No, he also mm. put oil in the wound, which soothed and brought um, healing and, and alleviated the pain. Now, a lot of churches, that's all they do with wounded people is they pour oil. And the person, over time, does not become whole. So I pray, I pray for Hope City to be an oil and wine church. Absolutely. That it pours joy and healing as well as truth and scripture into people's lives. As we talk about if you don't heal from what hurt you, you'll bleed on people that didn't cut you. And so a lot of times we're just walking around bleeding on people that didn't cut us. And I love that illustration because it's true. If we close it up too soon, that's the incubator accelerator place. And to really step into our purpose. So our, our, our mission, we talk about this all the time. We talk about some, some principles that we're really, really intentional on. That's that we want people to know God. Like in a day-to-day -day relationship, not a religious experience, but a day-to-day -day relationship with Jesus where you're in the word, you're in worship, you're praying every day. I want you to find freedom. Uh, that You go through a group, go through a freedom group. You join, you, you're part of what God is doing. We want you to discover your purpose. So they go through growth track. They join the team. They start serving. And then the last part is we want people to make a difference. I was talking to a guy uh, between the services, and he was talking about how, how, how lonely he's been as of late. And I talked to him about a TED Talk that I watched. And there was this prolific speaker who uh, touted about Buddhism, and he talked about all kinds of different religions, and he even mentioned Christianity, but he said, the one simple truth that I have found when it comes to connecting is simply serving with someone. He said, if you'll go out and actually be a part of a serve project, if you'll go out and be a part of something where you do it together, Jesus himself said it's better to give than it is to receive. And I feel like part of our culture here at Hope City is, y'all, we serve together. And if you've never been a part of one of our serve days, our Hope City Missions was all over the city yesterday doing serve projects all over the city. And I think part of adding value is adding value to people that may never walk in the doors of a church. People will read your life more than they'll ever read the Bible. So your character, your integrity, and who you are is so essential to the healing process as well. You, know, you think about that powerful picture in the book of Ruth, Dan, yeah, yeah. about the power of coming alongside, going with, journeying with people. So the book of Ruth should really be called the book of Naomi because she's really as equal a primary character in the book. You know the story well, Ruth chapter one, Naomi's husband dies. We don't know why he died. Her two adult sons who were newly married die. So this woman loses all three adult males in her life. There's been no grandchildren yet. So in the social structure of Israel, this woman is destined to be destitute the rest of her life. She did the math and she said, I've come up with this conclusion that God's against me. She says this, call me Mara or bitterness. Can you imagine going public with a name change and you've changed your name to bitter? That God is against you? And so the two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth. Not Oprah. Not Oprah, but Orpah and Ruth. <laughs> their husbands are gone, so they're bleeding as widows. And they're dealing with their mother-in-law who's a widow. So these three widows are there. But the two daughter-in-laws, out of duty and obligation, say, we're going to stay with you. And so the pain inside Naomi was pushing back against the love that was pressing in. And that's really the collision spiritually. It's not about necessarily good and evil. It's about pain and love right now. Wow. That's the collision. Wow. So what happens is Orpah and Ruth say, no, we're going to love you. Well, pain doesn't leave because love shows up one time. So... The pain doubled down, and Naomi says, 
Uh, no, if I was to be married uh, tonight, would you wait your whole life for my sons to grow up? No, God is against me. I am bitter. Go back and make a life. So Orpah does like a lot of churches. One of the daughters-in-law says, okay, peace out. I'm out of here. A lot of churches have done that in cities. Hey, man, we tried to help the poor. We tried to uh, do diversity and reconciliation. We tried it, and it's not working, so don't say we didn't give it a shot. And so they're out of here. They, they've ceased to press in. But Ruth is the picture of the kingdom. She says, no. Where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. Where you die, I'm going to die. And the Bible says when Naomi saw the determination of Ruth, she stopped urging her to leave. Because at some point, church, the love pressing in has to be more determined than the pain that's pressing, pushing back. So good. So that collision, wow. so that's why we feed, we love, we don't just do it once. We stay on this constant love journey with people at their lowest point. Now, here's the coolest thing about Ruth chapter one. Very last sentence. It says, so Naomi stopped urging Ruth to leave. So they journeyed together to Bethlehem, which means house of bread, at the beginning of the barley harvest. See, the role of a church like this is you have to create starting points for people. That's good. No matter who walks into a starting point, at the lowest point of life, Naomi's at the lowest point of life, equal to Job, honestly. And the very last line of the chapter, God slipped in a beginning. They went to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So we, God has a way of slipping in a new beginning at the lowest point in life. And that's what this church should be about. We walk with people and create starting points, new beginning points at people at their lowest ebb. But your love has to be more determined than their pain. Amen? Okay. Amen. Talk to me about, we were talking about the Mississippi. And I think as we are bringing this in for a landing, I think this is such a powerful narrative of a starting point. Because we all have them. We all have a starting point moment. My dad's was walking into a church. That's why we have a no throwaway service mentality here at Hope City. Whether you're at Cinco Woodlands, you're here at West Houston, you're watching online. Uh, we had all kinds of technical issues the last service. Uh, Mike's glitching. It was like delaying. And, and I was, it was like, I was like, go back to the pigs. Like it was potentially <laughs> demonic. We didn't know what was happening. I've never seen it. My 40 years, I never seen it. But give it up for our creative team because they fixed yes. it because it is working perfectly. My dad shows up to a tiny church with no air conditioning. That pastor that morning could have said, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. But he woke up because he had a no throwaway service mentality. My mom had given her life to the Lord, not a religious encounter, but a relationship encounter with Jesus. My dad showed up one time. He wasn't church shopping or church hopping. He wasn't checking out worship from one place. Wasn't checking out sermons from another. He felt like you go there or my kids are going there. And then we found a home there and we put our roots down there, but it was a starting point. My dad literally went from drug, drug abuse, alcoholism, womanizing, beating up people in their own driveway if they cut them off in traffic to lifting his hands and worshiping and singing about, it is well with my soul. I mean, the reconciliation and the supernatural power of God and the restoration was real, but it was a starting point. And I love this story about the Mississippi. How many of y'all can spell Mississippi? It's a lot of fun. Uh, okay, but I love the starting point that was from my dad because my brother, my sister, myself, my kids are all in the residual domino effect overflow of that decision. Powerful. It's powerful. And it's true that in this life, I tell uh, kingdom leaders, it's not what you achieve. It's what you set in motion. And most of everything we're doing in this church and through our university, it's not for the big people in this room. It's for all the littles Come that on. are running in Come these on. hallways. It's not about us. It's about all these littles running, running to and fro. I shared a very simple illustration about this. I know I sit up here. You don't know me. Uh, I introduced my beautiful wife. I show you 11 grandkids. I tell you this very fast. These are all my ESP, ESPN highlight dunks. You're only seeing my highlights you, and you really know nothing about my childhood. Uh, we moved 27 times by the time I was 16, lived in a car. We, lived, we stayed on people's couches. Uh, we grew up in chaos. People say, how did you get from point A to point B? How did you become a university president like this? I said, oh, I had a, I had a big advantage as a child. 
God gave me a big head start. And they said, what, money, education? I said, no, chaos. I went to a different school from K through eighth. I love your story when you were 12. Tell them about that one. Which I've got so many stories. Choir, the choir. Story. Oh, I'm going to get to that. Get to that real quick. Is uh, but being on a different playground every year, for eight years in a row, where you have to develop some mad superpowers of engagement, or you or you become a fighter, or you become a person who can build friendships. So all the chaos of childhood. Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, transacted the chaos. So if you've been to hell and back, you actually are the person I'm looking for in this room. Because when the Holy Spirit takes that life and transacts that testimony, your competency for the kingdom of God is off the charts. Off the charts. So I'm from Minnesota. I love studying how things become over time. So put that first picture real fast. We'll do this super fast. So that's a picture of the United States. There's a deep purple line. I know some of you said, hey, that looks like the x-ray of my leg, uh, uh, the varicose vein in my leg. So uh, those from the 1900s yeah, would understand yeah. that joke. Um, that's the Mississippi River. It starts in northern Minnesota, and it dumps out here in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm very curious what things look like when they begin. What churches look like when they start? What leaders were like when they were children? So I made my way to Lake Itasca in northern Minnesota to find the start of the Mississippi. Here it is. So the Mississippi uh, is on the uh, your left, your right side there of those rocks. So Lake Itasca, it's spring-fed, and those rocks right there mark... The start of the Mississippi River, it's 12 inches deep and it's 20 feet across. You can walk across the Mississippi and not even get your knee caps wet. So that's what it looks like when it starts. But given time to become, given a thousand storms, given hundreds of tributaries and creeks and floods and overflows and billions upon billions of raindrops, Given time, this is what the Mississippi becomes from 12 inches deep and 20 feet across when it's all said and done. This is what it looks like at the end. Next picture. So powerful is that body of water that it pushes back the ocean. When I look at your life, when I look at these children, when I look at a church, what we're seeing is the beginning of things that look fledgling. That's why I love education. 12 inches deep, 20 feet across. How could that become that? 1976, I end up in Redding, California. And my grandparents are going to this small church called Bethel Church in Redding. And this pastor there, Darlene and Earl Johnson, the Johnsons, had two boys. One's name was Bobby Johnson. He was 13, my age. We became fast friends. And Bobby had an older brother named Bill Johnson that was 23 this family took me and I lived with them for two and a half years in their house. They saved my life. And so one day they said, we're going to start a youth choir. And so I said, okay. So they drove me to youth choir practice. Seven of us were there. Seven junior high kids, five girls and two boys. Me and Bobby were the two boys and five girls. You think we're going to sing in front of five junior high girls? You're crazy. <laughs> they put on a Keith Green record. We're supposed to sing to the record. Nobody's opening their mouth. We're all going, uh, sweating. Uh. So they try this for two weeks and realize it's a massive catastrophe. And they pull the plug on the youth choir in the summer of 1976 at Bethel Church. Forty years later, I had the privilege of preaching the keynote on the Friday night of the Los Angeles Jesus Culture Conference. There was about twelve to 14,000 young adults at the Long Beach Arena. Kim Walker's out there singing the Holy Spirit song. I'm on the stage about to walk out. I'm seeing 12,000 plus people singing at the top of their lungs, blowing the roof off this, singing a song that the whole planet is singing. And it hits me. This is that youth group. Jesus culture is the youth group out of Bethel Church. 40 years ago, this youth group were seven kids who wouldn't open their mouth. How in one lifetime, we're not talking about ancient Babylon here, friends. How in my lifetime did a youth group of seven kids who wouldn't open up their mouth now 
teach the world to sing at the top of their lungs. Because what the kingdom is about, what the Lord is doing is taking all of our lives. We feel fledgling, 12 inches deep, 20 feet across. We're making no impact, man. Nobody's knees even get wet walking across my gifts. Young people, children running these hallways. But when given time and a lifetime of grace and somehow between 12 and nearly 60 now, I've lived long enough to see how God does this. And what he's actually doing is profound, that he's raising up churches that we're trying to find a place to meet that becomes so dynamic in the kingdom. They push back darkness, they push back principalities, they push back uh, gates of hell and nations, like the Mississippi pushing back the ocean. That's my prayer for Hope City Church. You're underway. This place is becoming. It started seven years ago, and it's a non-stop moment till Jesus comes for Hope City. Believe in each other. Believe in the mission. God bless you guys. Dr. Hagen, so literally we've got our Cinco, our Woodlands here at West Houston. We've got a house party with hundreds watching in Uganda right now. Uh, and we've got our Hope City Tanzania campus, literally house parties all over. Will you pray? Will you pray over us, uh, over us as a church, whether we're at a starting point spot as individuals, or maybe we feel, and I feel strong about this, maybe there are people that are watching or in the room at one of our locations that maybe they feel like they've kind of served their season. Maybe they're in their older veteran season and they don't know if there's any room left for them. Would you just pray a blessing and a, and a prophetic prayer over those at the beginning, those that feel like they, maybe they don't have a voice any longer, but they do? as we continue to move forward as a church. Amen. Can we stand together, friends, across the room? Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we come to you without hype. Lord Jesus, we come to you without manipulation. Father, we come to you without our stage presence, our stage voice, our wordsmithing, our talent, our poetry, God. Lord, we are in need of you, Jesus, this nation, Lord, from neighborhoods here in Houston, God, to nations like Ukraine, God. This earth, Lord, is pulsating with spiritual activity, Lord. We believe it is all aiming toward your return. So, Jesus, we prepare our hearts. We submit our hearts, Lord. We pray for fresh fire, Lord. Lord, for you to renew and stir up the gift that is within us, God. Right now, Lord, we just pray, Lord, for a new vitality, Jesus. Anybody that's sitting on the fence, God, with their confession of Christ as their Lord, right now, Lord, in this meeting, in just a moment when Daniel calls for them to be saved, they would be saved in the next few seconds, God. And Lord, I pray if there's any lethargy, if there's any disappointment, Lord, if there's any passivity, God, that has crept into my life, Lord, because of the pain, Lord, I know what it's like in the inner city of Minneapolis, what it's been like the last two years, Jesus. Help us. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. Lord, knit this congregation together, God with their pastors, Lord. Thank you for the work of the fosters, Lord. Thank you for the work of every leader and staff that has planted good seed, Jesus. Bless all the work of their hands, God. And now, Lord, in this new season, Lord, of something not just else, but something more, Lord, that you're about to do, Jesus. Lord, bring the entire congregation upward, forward, God, in a new maturity, new fire, new strength. And Lord, bring it to pass, God. And let them be like the mighty Mississippi, Jesus. Let them push back strongholds and push back principalities and push back darkness and nations, Lord Jesus. In your mighty name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you, Pastor. Dr. Hagen, come on, give it up for Dr. Hagen, our time with him today. Thank you, sir. Y'all can be seated. We're about to dismiss. Thank you guys for, for being a part of this weekend for Beyond the Blessing Week 2. I do want to say something before anybody leaves, if you could just remain seated for a moment. Dr. Hagen just talked about those confessing. Here at Hope City, we don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons or a religious response, but Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, literally says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. 
So maybe you're watching online, maybe you're at Cinco Woodlands here at West Houston, one of our uh, house parties right now, or Tanzania, and you say, Daniel, the truth is, I don't know Jesus, but something has been stirring in me all throughout this service. It's convincing me of the fact that there's more to life than the way I've been living with every eye closed just for a moment. You can type yes to Jesus online. Our moderators, our team will be there to help you. But in this room or one of our locations today, if you wanna know him as your savior, if you wanna know Jesus as your personal Lord and savior, if you want your story to shift, because he's already written victory in your story and all that it takes is surrender. Or maybe the second invitation, you say, Daniel, I, I gave my life to Jesus, but I fell away and I wanna rededicate my life today. I got caught up in the prodigal life, but today's the day when I wanna make everything right with Jesus. I'm gonna to count to three across all of our locations. I want you to boldly lift up your hand. One, I wanna give my life to Jesus. Two, I wanna rededicate my life. When I hit three, if that's you, I want you to lift up your hand today. Three, if that's you, I want you to lift up your hand. Today's my day. I see hand, 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 hands going up all over West Houston. Just leave them up for a minute. I see Co at the Woodlands. Come on, hands lifted. Amazing, you put your hands down. We're gonna pray as a church family. And again, we're not just praying it to pray it, but we're gonna confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. And you watch, everything is about to shift. Say this out loud, say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it's not working. From today on, I choose to live for you. I confess my sins, every struggle, all my issues, even my hidden struggles, I surrender it all to you. And from this point on, I choose to live for you. You are my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord, in Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise?